All right, welcome back, everybody, to Season 2, Episode 9 of the Building Lifelong Athletes Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Renicki. Thanks so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Today, we're going to talk about all things statins. So I know we've talked about statins a couple times previously, more for like general treatment, but today we're going to kind of dive in deeper about you know how they work, some things that are unique to them, the different types of statins, their side effects, and how to manage those side effects. So let's get started. And so let's talk about the history. Where did statins actually come from? Well, if you go back, Merck, which is a pharmaceutical company, they discovered a compound from Aspergillus terris called mavinolin, and that became lovastatin. So essentially they found a fungus and they found a compound from that and it became lovastatin. And then later there's a compound from a monascus ruber and they called it monoclonal K, which is also known as red yeast rice. So we had this monoclonal K or red yeast rice and this mavinolin, and they found out that these two compounds were actually the same thing. And so statins originated from fungus. So I, I kind of find it funny when people say like, you know, I, I only want things in natural way. It's like, well, this was a natural plant. They found it and then they've kind of made it pharmaceutical grade. And so the history of statins that we're getting them from a fungus. So I thought that was super interesting. When we talk about statins, there are numerous different types, right? You know, there's kind of like seven main types. So the main ones you might hear are atorvastatin, fluvastatin, lovastatin, patavastatin, pravastatin, rosuvastatin, and simvastatin. So obviously there's a commonality there, meaning statins. That's why we call them statins. The end of the name is statin. That's how you know it's that class of medication. Some are used more frequently than others. Like I said, a lot of times in clinic, you won't see things like patavastatin, not as much fluvastatin. A lot of times you'll see the most common ones are atorvastatin, lovastatin, you know, pravastatin, rosuvastatin, simvastatin. So those are kind of the more, you know, mainstream ones. And so how do statins work? Well, if you go way back to our cholesterol metabolism lecture, if you remember, it inhibits HMG CoA reductase. So HMG CoA reductase is the rate limiting enzyme inside cholesterol synthesis right inside the liver. And so we are blocking the synthesis of cholesterol inside the liver. That's, you know, number one. Number two, there seems to be an increased expression in the LDL receptors of the liver. So if you go back and remember that as well, when we have more LDL receptors, we have more opportunities for the LDL particles to bind and then get brought in and get recycled or get rid of or whatever they, have, they do. Um, but once again, if we have more of those LDL receptors, we're going to have a lower LDL. So it is decreasing LDL by not only decreasing the amount of cholesterol that our body actually makes, but also increasing our LDL receptors. So that's important to know. All right, so now let's talk about the pharmacokinetics of statins. So pharmacokinetics just kind of means essentially how things are broken down in the body, how they move throughout the body, kind of some chemistry involved there. But you know, one important topic I want to talk about is that statins that are lipophilic versus hydrophilic. So lipophilic meanings lipo, love, they're fat soluble. Essentially, atorvastatin, fluvastatin, lovastatin, patavastatin are lipophilic statins, and then our hydrophilic ones are pravastatin, rosuvastatin, and simvastatin. And this is important because when we have these two different classes, it's important to know that, hey, if someone's not tolerating one class of medication, then we can try the other class. So let's say someone's not tolerating atorvastatin, which is lipophilic, we could try rosuvastatin, which is hydrophilic. It just gives us some more options. On top of that, these statins have different half-lives as well. So the ones that have specifically long half-lives are atorvastatin, patavastatin, and rosuvastatin. And because of such a long half-life, they can be taken at any time of the day. You know, the other ones we recommend taking at night, but these atorvastatin, patavastatin, and rosuvastatin can be taken any time of the day. Specifically, rosuvastatin has a pretty darn long half-life. And so we can actually take it, you know, multiple times throughout the week, meaning we can take it once every day. We could take it every other day, maybe even three times per week. Well, you know, and that's really beneficial. You know, we're still going to get some cholesterol lowering effect, but you know, maybe we have to space it out because we're having some side effects. So just an important thing to understand because it gives us some tools in our toolbox that we can be flexible to kind of get the effects we want, but also minimize side effects. And like I mentioned before, the other statins, like simvastatin, should be taken at night due to the dineural rhythm of HMG CoA reductase. Essentially, what that means is that the way it optimally functions, taking these medications at night seem to work better. And all these things are nice and fancy, but I guess the question is, you know, what are the clinical changes we are most concerned with? Well, the things I want you to know is that atorvastatin and rosuvastatin are the highest potency statins and have the most robust LDL lowering. So when we say high potency, that just means we expect them to have a significant reduction in their LDL. And so atorvastatin and rosuvastatin, those are our highest intensity statins. And so when we talk about dosing, like I said, we break it down into low intensity, moderate intensity, and high intensity. When we talk about low intensity statins, we expect to see less than a 30% decrease in LDL. So obviously if someone's like borderline, right? It's like just a little bit elevated, maybe just need a whiff of something. A low dose statin might do the job. Lower by 30%, get us within goal. That's totally reasonable. The low intensity statin doses are simvastatin, which is 10 milligrams, pravastatin at 10 or 20, lovastatin at 20 milligrams, or patavastatin at 1 milligrams. Once again, patavastatin, not very common. And then when we bump up after low, we go to moderate. So moderate, we expect to see about a 30 to less than 50% reduction. So getting pretty significant here. This is when we start to add on atorvastatin, or some people call it Lipitor. That's the, you know, the brand name for it. But atorvastatin, 10 to 20 milligrams is a moderate dose. 
Rosuvastatin is five to 10 milligrams. And then Simvastatin is 20 to 40 milligrams. You know, Simvastatin, another brand name is also Zocor. Some people say that, like I said, I don't love including brand names, but some people know it just by that. So that's as well. And then in terms of modern intensity, we also have Pravastatin at 40 or 80 milligrams, Lovastatin at 40 milligrams, and then Fluvastatin can also be 80 milligrams or 40 milligrams twice a day. And once again, we have Patavastatin, which can be two to four milligrams. So that's a lot of stuff. Just a real quick recap. The ones you're most likely to see from modern intensity are Atorvastatin, 10 or 20, Rosuva, 5 to 10, Simvastatin, 20 to 40, or Pravastatin, 40 to 80. Those are the big ones that you're going to see. And then when we get up to the high intensity statins, here we expect to see a greater than 50% reduction in our LDL. So it's just, this is our, our big hitters here. We're going to see a big change. These are our Torvastatin, 40 and 80, or Rosuvastatin, which is Crestor, 20 to 40 milligrams. So once again, a Torvastatin, 40 or 80 milligrams, or Rosuvastatin, 20 to 40 milligrams. So those are our doses that we typically see of statins. There are also some ethnic concerns I want to talk about as well in terms of Asian patients might have higher doses of statins in their blood. So it is recommended to start them with a lower dose because you know they might have more side effects. And so, like I said, when dosing someone or if you're on a medication yourself, I know just something to consider is that if you have Asian ancestry or have Asian heritage, you may just metabolize it a little slower and you have more of the medication around. So we just want to be careful and start lower and then gradually work our way up. All right, now I wanna talk about side effects. And side effects, I wanna talk about these and get ahead of this, and yeah, of course there are side effects. There are gonna be side effects for any medication that's actually working. If there are no side effects to a medication, then that means it's probably not doing anything in your body, right? Like something's just a placebo or a homeopathic dose or something, and there's no side effects. Well, that's because it's not physiologically doing anything. So this, as we know, is blocking our cholesterol synthesis, so of course we're gonna have some side effects. But we're gonna talk about those. People will make you sound like it's the end of the world, that it's the worst side effects ever, and that people are dying from this left and right, and that's just far from the truth. But there are side effects and we should talk about them. First, let's talk about our hepatic side effects or our liver side effects. You may have an elevation in your LFTs. Your LFTs are something called your liver function tests and that's kind of a short term for it. It's your AST, ALT. You do also have these in your muscles as well, but we use these as markers of you know, liver damage. And so you can see an elevation in these LFTs. A lot of times they are transient. It goes back down. It is usually not a big deal whatsoever, um, but it is, can definitely happen. And in fact, you know, there's less than two per million patient years do we see a serious liver injury. So, you know, in terms of serious liver injury, less than two per million patient years. So that's a lot of patient years. So it's very, very rare to happen. You know, FDA did look at this. The FDA looked at liver injuries and determined that there was not an increased risk of liver injury with statin use. And so what they recommend is baseline liver testing. So obviously it's good to know if you you have a really, really elevated AST or ALT or, or liver issues, then maybe a statin medication is not the best you know, choice for you at that time, but they recommend baseline testing. And then only you need to check it again, only if you're having concern for liver injury, meaning you're having symptoms or you're having, you know, something else that makes you think about it. But, you know, and this is also important to know that people who have NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease can still be on statins. So they have, you know, some bumps in their ASD, ALT, but the, the benefit of them outweighs the risk. So that's it for the liver ones. You know, like I said, very rare to have a serious, serious liver issue, um, but it can be, be something that we see. So we want to keep an eye on it. But most of the time you'll see a transient increase in these LFTs. And then if you check it a couple months later, it's already down there. All right, next we wanna talk about the muscles. This is probably the most complained about symptom. Up to 29% of patients complain about these symptoms. So we're not sure of the true cause. You know, Is it damage to the mitochondria potentially? Is it decreased production of CoQ10 when around the statins? We're not entirely sure, but it just seems to be the most common complaint of side effects. So. And when we talk about statin associated you know, symptoms with this, there are kind of a spectrum, right? So we have something called statin associated muscle symptoms or SAMs. This is kind of like the most benign, lowest level. Then we have something called myalgias and then myositis. And so there's a bunch of things that can happen. When in terms of the statin associated muscle symptoms, that's kind of on the farthest left, meaning like, okay, we have some just kind of generalized, not feeling good, maybe some muscle aches, but there's no actual damage there going on there. Myalgias are explained as flu-like aches, stiffness, maybe some tenderness as well. Then we start creeping up to like myalgias or myopathies. A myopathy is actually where we have muscle weakness and a CK elevation. CK is another lab marker we use, which essentially is a marker of muscle damage. And so we use that with myopathy, we'll have weakness and CK elevation. Then we have myositis. Myositis is muscle inflammation. And then we have something called myonecrosis, which is kind of on the farthest side of things. So when we see myonecrosis, you know, we're essentially thinking that we're having some breakdown in death of the muscle. And this is going to have a profound muscle elevation. A lot of times, and can be categorized in mild, moderate, severe. Mild is only three to 10 times the upper limit of normal of the CK. So if there's an upper limit normal of the CK value, it's only three to 10 times elevated. Whereas moderate is 10 to 49 times and severe is greater than 50 times the upper limit of normal. So obviously if we saw those, that is something we wanna talk about. We wanna look at that. We'd probably stop the medication and kind of look at things and reconsider. But these are, we're starting to get here where like, okay, if we're getting these, we're gonna kind of push pause on things and probably, probably stop the medication, let things calm down. 
All right, and the most severe and last one we're gonna talk about is rhabdomyolysis, where essentially this is myonecrosis with the release of myoglobin into the urine and bloodstream, so myoglobinuria, and then it could cause acute renal failure, so having kidney issues. That's like the biggest thing we worry about with uh, rhabdo, is what they'll say. You know, very, very rare, but once again, can happen. There are some risk factors. The biggest risk factors are having an age over 80, a small body frame, fragility, multi-organ pathologies, so just lots of comorbidities, large quantities of grapefruit juice consumption, so if you're just crushing grapefruit juice, that can happen. Trauma from surgery, you know, change in physical activity, like an extreme change, went from doing nothing to doing a lot, or alcohol use as well. And then on top of it, like I said, those are the, the spectrums that we think of having muscle injury. So it is a spectrum. Sometimes we just see a little bit of bump, and that's no big deal. Other times we see this myonecrosis. Very, very rarely do we see you know severe myonecrosis or rhabdomyolysis, but it is, is reported, so we have to talk about it. All right, so next I want to talk about diabetes. Do statins cause diabetes? If you look online, once again, people will say, statins cause diabetes. That's why you shouldn't take them. Well, you know, let me break it down for you a little bit here. The FDA does state there is a chance, albeit small, small chance to develop diabetes while on statin medications. Like I said, they also say though that, you know, taking medication does not, the benefit definitely outweighs the risk. So they do recommend you take that medication. And so when you say, whoa, Jordan, you just said it causes diabetes. Like, I'm not going to take that. Let me break it down a little bit further for you here. You know, they did find that it was much, much more common to develop this diabetes in a certain pattern of patients. So essentially they'd have one of these four risk factors, meaning an A1C over six obesity and impaired fasting glucose or metabolic syndrome. So essentially what we're saying is this is the insulin resistant patient. You know, like I said, they're knocking on the door of diabetes. Probably we're going to develop diabetes one way or another down the line. It's just maybe expedited just a little bit. So these people were probably going to get diabetes. And so it just kind of bumped them into that area to actually having diabetes. And that being said, these are the exact type of patients who we would benefit from a statin. So we'd still recommend them to be on a statin, even if they got diabetes from it. Like I said, once again, it wasn't necessarily them developing diabetes out of the blue from their statin. It's more like it just unmasks their underlying insulin resistance. But like I said, once again, they do recommend you still take the statin, even if you have diabetes. And so like I said, we can talk all, all about that all you want. But like I said, that is the general idea when people say like, it causes diabetes. Usually it's on someone who's already knocking on diabetes' door. All right, next I wanna talk about memory. Some people say that statins induce memory loss or dementia or Alzheimer's or things like that. And you know, other people say it actually prevents you from getting that. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about here. There was a meta-analysis done in 2013 of 20,000 patients that showed no association with statins and memory loss and actually found a 29% reduction in incident dementia. So that being said, it did not show that it increased the risk of dementia and actually may be protected from it. However, other studies didn't really show the improvement in cognition with statins. So overall, the net data seems to show that it does not lead to an associated risk with memory loss, but it doesn't show improvement necessarily. And so in the event of memory loss, we're obviously gonna work it up, right? We're gonna get cognitive tests. Then we're gonna talk about maybe stopping medication, changing dose, or changing from a lipophilic to a hydrophilic statin. And the reason we think about that is lipophilic tends to get to the brain easier. And so if we stop from a lipophilic to a hydrophilic statin, maybe that helps and improves our memory symptoms. And so all these bad things, right? We've talked about, you know, what all these terrible things statins can do, you know, what are the positive effects of statins? So obviously other than the LDL lowering and decreasing outcomes, you know, I've spent so many podcasts talking about that. We know that it decreases our LDL and it seems like it decreases, you know, important numbers for us, meaning it lowers the amount of heart attacks and strokes and, you know, actually improves mortality. So all these awesome things that it does do, but it also may have powerful anti-inflammatory effects as well. Maybe beneficial for certain cancers like colorectal breast or hepatocellular cancer, could potentially prevent recurrent strokes, can maybe even improve rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. So there's lots of things and lots of benefits that seem to be attached to not only the LDL lowering, but the anti-inflammatory properties as well. And that being said, it is worth noting that there are lots of drug-drug interactions, meaning if you're taking statins and you're taking another medication, you just gotta be careful about that. The reason we worry about that is it does interact with the cytochrome P450 enzymes. So these are enzymes that are found in the liver and the organic transport proteins, once again, also fun liver. So anything that interacts with either of those can be affected. Some big ones that we want to look out for are gemfibrozil. So essentially this also inhibits that OATP or the organic transport protein in the liver. And so what happens is it keeps the statin around long in the liver and leads to increased side effects. So if you're on this gemfibrozil or fibrate medication with a statin, we should just pause for a second and just think about, you know, do we really need this? Do we need both these medications? Because it may lead to an increased level of statin, which can lead to side effects. So we do want to caution when using both those together. On top of that, some other medications, including rifampin, cyclosporine, antiretrovirals, all can interact with statins. And so just something to keep in mind, if you're on medications, you just, just should check um, with your physician to see if there's any interactions as well. 
All right, so now we're gonna talk about statin intolerance. So essentially statin intolerance, there's no one definition we'll talk about in a little bit what it might be, but this is essentially what it is, is that we're not able to take the medication that the way we prescribed it. So there's some issue or some barrier preventing someone from taking it. And overall, 90% of people who report an intolerance to a statin can actually still take a statin when we kind of tweak things around. And so it is not the be all end all saying, hey, if I had an issue with one that you're gonna necessarily have issue with all of them, might need to switch statins or alternate the dosing regimens. And at the end of the day, only like three to 5% of people have a complete intolerance of statins. So the vast majority of people who have issues with statins are, are able to find a way to, to take the medication in some way, shape, or form where they're still getting benefit from it. However, the stats are kind of crazy. 20% of patients don't take their daily prescribed statin because of intolerance, whether it be side effects or whatnot. And at the end of the day, 40 to 75% stop therapy within two years. And so it's actually kind of a big deal, right? You know, we're prescribing this medication to someone and then anywhere from a quarter to three quarters of people stop it within two years. And so, I, you know, that's a huge issue. And we want to make sure we get out in front of that. All right, so we talked about the definition. Now let's talk about like what questions are we actually gonna ask in clinic to see if it's affecting people. So first things first, you know, we wanna make sure that we're recording these symptoms, getting a good history and understanding what's going on. First, we ask about location. Is this bilateral? Is it unilateral? When did this happen? Did it happen right after you started or was it after months? Did these did the improvement happen after you stopped medication? And when you restarted, did you have symptoms again? And look at all these things are important. We always wanna ask a bunch of different questions. And, and we care so much about when these muscle symptoms happen because over 75% of these symptoms start within 12 weeks and about 90% within six months. So once again, if someone's been on it for years and years, it's less likely that if they're having muscle symptoms that it's actually coming from the statins. We also wanna consider family history or medical conditions. So if you have thyroid conditions or you just started a intense exercise regimen, that may be playing into it. Maybe you're vitamin D deficient, have different medications that may interact with it or family history of statin intolerance. That's important to know. We also wanna make sure this is not you know, caused by a nocebo effect. So the nocebo effect is the opposite of the placebo. Placebo is when you take a medication and you know it's the placebo and you think you're gonna get better and then so you do. Whereas nocebo is essentially where you take a medication or you think it is, it's actually the placebo and you think you know, you're know you worried about issues or side effects and then you develop those symptoms. And so a lot of times this can be found in, in statin trials. We've seen that people who take the medication um, have X amount of symptoms and people who take placebo also have about the same amount of symptoms. And so we have gotta make sure it's you know not necessarily the nocebo effect, but that can happen. And then also we wanna ask about the acceptability of symptoms and you know kind of discuss risk benefits right so it can be helpful if someone's having symptoms to check the ck which is that lab marker for muscle pain and like i said if we have muscle pain and the ck is elevated to greater than four times the upper limit normal typically we'll hold the statin and then we'll hold it till the ck normalizes which usually takes about four to six weeks um, if we have muscle pain you know but it's tolerable and you say eh, it's no big deal and the ck is less than four times upper limit normal then we can like just try a lower statin dose or we can spread it out a little bit and we can recheck again in four to six weeks make make sure everything's okay maybe we have muscle pain that's intolerable the ck is less than four times upper limit normal we'd still stop the statin there right so you know we're not seeing huge levels of muscle damage but if someone's saying hey these muscle symptoms are are not tolerable to me, then we stop and we try to figure out, hey, do we need to regress things back? Do we need to change the, the way we're doing it? Anything like that. So there's lots of different things we can do. And so at the end of the day, lots of considerations, just lots of questions. And then we can also get those lab work on as well to kind of determine, but we really want to determine the severity, right? So if it's tolerable, a lot of times these will disappear in two to four weeks. So if someone says, hey, I've been having these symptoms and say, okay, how long have you been having for? Two days. Well, okay, let's give it a little time. And you know, so you can check the labs, make sure there's nothing crazy going on. But if it's tolerable and it's not really elevated, we can kind of keep going and see if it gets better. And then that can also help us just understand, hey, where are we going from here? What options do we have? Like I said, we also have to make sure this is not a nocebo effect that gives us time. When we say, hey, let's give it a little bit longer, it kind of helps us understand if this is from nocebo or not. In a randomized controlled trial, they essentially had an open label and a blinded phase of the trial. So open label means they knew what they were getting and blinded means they didn't know what they were getting. And in this, they had 38 to 70 percent of statin adverse effects were due to the nocebo effects. So they kind of compared the blinded group versus the open label and found that anywhere from like 40 to 80 percent of the adverse effects were due to this nocebo effect or this effect of people thinking they're going to have it. And so, if we're having these symptoms, right, the first question is, do we need to switch medications? You know, right? If we go for our lipophilic ones, which are tovastatin, simvastatin, fluvastatin, lovastatin, and those are the main ones there, do we switch it then to maybe hydrophilic, which is the pravastatin and rosuvastatin? The hydrophilic seem to be better tolerated, so pravastatin and rosuvastatin seem to be better tolerated, so that's a, a something to consider as well. And then we're gonna talk about, hey, do we need to reduce the dose or dosing strategies? Maybe we do alternate day dosings. That can be very reasonable. Or maybe we're just not tolerating this well, we need to try another medication. Something like azetamibe, a PCNS SK9 inhibitor, or maybe bempedoic acid, which is kind of not really 
out there yet, but it's getting there. Essentially what it does is it also blocks cholesterol synthesis in the liver, but inhibits the ATP citrate lyase enzyme, which is an enzyme that's necessary for cholesterol, but it's more specific to liver and you don't have as many muscle symptoms. And like I said, muscle symptoms seem to be the most important symptom that people complain about. And so these are just some strategies. I wanted to talk about this statin medications, you know, controversial for sure on the internet, but they seem to be very, very well tolerated in general for most people. And like I said, they're actually life-saving medications. They lower cholesterol, they prevent cardiovascular events. And so it's important to understand what you're getting yourself into. You should always know the possible risks of a medication, but also the possible benefits. And so, like I said, this is always going to be in conjunction with the conversation with the physician, right? I don't think you should ever just get prescribed medication and without understanding what you're taking it for or why you're taking it. And so I'm not saying that's what should happen at all, but I want you to have this information so you can feel empowered to say, Hey, okay, this is, you know, I, I've heard about this before, you know, Dr. Renke's talked about this. And so have an idea to kind of have a game plan. Hey, if I'm on a medication and I have symptoms, like these are the options that I have. And so I hope you found this helpful. Um, I really appreciate you sticking around. That means the world to me. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you could drop a like comment, subscribe, or share with a friend that would be super, super helpful. And I'd really appreciate that. But thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Now get off the computer, go outside, enjoy the rest of your day.